what i'd like to do is is start off with a discussion of the discoveries that underpin our understanding of the secret tory pathway now in order to appreciate this you have to think back to the middle of the twentieth century when electron microscope was first being used in biology and it revealed that the internal structure of cells was incredibly more complex than people had ever realized and in fact cells were chock full of these different membrane compartments and this raised a whole set of questions in terms of what is this giant mess of what came to be known as organelles doing inside the cell? What are their functions? What goes on in those different compartments? And one of the key questions was, are these different compartments linked together in some sort of functional way? And the reason that this question was so important was that this work dovetailed with a lot of earlier work that had been looking at hormone secretion, particularly insulin, and the question of how different hormones that are produced inside of cells get out of the cells and into the bloodstream. So this question of how these different membrane bound compartments, are they linked together? And is this somehow connected to how hormones, particularly insulin, exit the cell? So the key guy in this was George Pilati whose name you might be familiar with because his name is on a building over at the medical school. So he was uh, one of the great cell biologists. And his big dis discovery was basically combining electron microscopy with biochemistry in the same way that Barbara Pierce did, although he predated her, to figure out how the entire secretory pathway works and a lot of other pathways as well. So here's at Rockefeller. And so this is what what George Pilati knew. So I can't remember if he named the endoplasmic reticulum. I'm pretty sure he did. But he looked by EM, and the ribosome had just been discovered. So he could see these dots all over the ER, the rough ER. And he knew that the ribosome was connected to translation, protein synthesis. And so the question he was interested in, and like everyone was interested in, was for proteins like insulin. You know it's made inside the cell, but somehow it gets out of the cell. And understanding that's super important for understanding diabetes, right? Because, you know, back, you know, insulin, the discovery of insulin and ability to purify it was only like in the early, like 1910, 1920. So, you know, he's operating in 1940, 1950. So we don't even really know how it works, how it's made. But it's really important to kind of understand that to try to get it at the disease. So he knew that proteins were being made on the ER. And so his idea was, well, maybe this is how proteins, this is the first step in getting proteins out of the cell, proteins like insulin, right? So is this... Is this like, you know, the starting line for your favorite marathon or race or, you know, binge watching on Netflix or whatever? Episode one, right? For the non-athletic among us. So, um, so what he came up with was this idea. So what you really would like to know is, and this is the recurring theme in cell biology, is you like to be able to track molecules in space and time. Like, you want to know where a molecule is. It's not just that it's being made, but where in the cell it is. So he came up with this experiment. I mean, this concept of an experiment predated him, but how he used it was, and this is called a pulse chase. So the idea is you give a pulse of something, and then you wash out whatever it is, radiation, fluorescence, and you give it unlabeled stuff. And then you watch where the labeled material moves through the cell, or through biochemistry. You kind of do a lot of this in metabolic biochemistry. So he took guinea pig cells, and he added tritiated leucine, because, you know, hey, why not? So a radioactive amino acid, right? And then he did a three-minute pulse. So one dash means minute. And so all the proteins made during those three minutes that have leucine, and most of them have leucine, at least one, get radio labeled. So they're now radioactive. Congratulations. <laughs> Welcome to Chernobyl. Then you wash it out. So then you get rid of the radioactive 
leucine in the media and replace it with cold leucine, normal leucine, right? And so that's called the wash slash chase step. So what you're able to do is during those, th so what you can do is see where the radiation went after the initial pulse. And so you ask, where did it go? And so he needed a way to detect the radiation, but like it, with EM level resolution, like to see where the proteins were on a picture of the cell, like a map, like you are here, right? you are at the student center. This is where Panda Express is. <laughs> so what he figured out, and this is, you know, this is an experiment that becomes harder and harder to explain, and so you have the cell. Let's say all the radiation's in the Golgi. How do you tell where the radiation is? So he poured liquid, uh, poured liquid sodium nitrate over the top. So basically, if you take old school film, you know that thing that people used before cameras, before 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 smartphones. That's what I meant to say. So you pour basically film emulsion on it. The radiation exposes the film, and you. You basically, it gets dark wherever the silver nitrate is. So the same way that people, do, you discovered x-rays, it's exactly the same concept. And so you could see where the radiation was. So he took all these time points, and what he saw was, so this is the ER, this is the Golgi, and then here's like the final part, right? The secretory vesicle. So in the first three minutes, it's all in the ER. So the ER is dark. Then, what did I say, 20 minutes later, it's all in the Golgi. Right, so this is where the radiation goes. So it's all in the ER, then 20 minutes, it's in the Golgi, and at 100 minutes, it's in the secretory vesicle. So he was able to take these different compartments and show that they were connected and that they acted in sequence. So you go from the ER to the Golgi to the secretory vesicles. So this set of membranes is an ordered pathway. Now if you think about this for a minute, particularly if you've taken molecular biology and you know probably if you, also if you took build one, you should think this experiment should never have worked. And so, so the question is, where does translation happen in the cell? In the cytoplasm, right? I mean, it happens on the ER too, right? Because that's why we have a rough ER. But it's not just only on the ER, right? So the, so the question is, um, why wasn't the entire cell dark? Why didn't he just get a black rectangle when he did this experiment? And my suspicion is the first time he did it, that's exactly what he got. And then he had to think about it and try to figure out how to solve that problem. So, so you would imagine if you just gave a pulse of a radioactive amino acid, proteins are being made everywhere. And so the whole cell is just radioactive and exposes the film, right? Um, so, and the, the reason for going through this is because this is a really common trick in all of cell biology. It's, if you wanna solve a specific problem, find, like if you're interested in how proteins get out of the cell, look at a cell that spends all of its time making proteins to be secreted. So if you're, some of you, may, how many of you have heard of telomerase, for example? Like most of you, right? Because it's aging and blah, blah, blah. So if you want to study something that controls, so telomerase replicates the ends of chromosomes because there's a special problem there. So if you want to identify the enzyme that does that, you can look in humans, but we only have 23 pairs of chromosomes, 46 total, right? So the amount of enzyme you need is pretty small. What you want is a chromosome with a shit ton of, you want an organism with a ton of chromosomes, right? And so that's why Liz Blackburn and Carol Greider worked on tetrahymena, which fragments its genome into thousands of chromosomes. In fact, almost every chromosome is just a single gene. So you go where the action is. If you're interested in chromosomes, go to an organism with lots of chromosomes. It's not like brain surgery, right? So it's kind of interesting in, in terms of thinking about like people become, a lot of science is just these kind of obvious thought processes, but we kind of mask it in like, we well, have to have positive controls and negative controls. It's just like, okay, I want to do this. Working with HeLa cells isn't doing it. So, so the trick was find a cell that does lots of secretion, right? Because then most of the protein synthesis 
is being moved into the ER like a cell that makes like tons of insulin, like a pancreatic cell, right? So 85% of the proteins in pancreatic cells are secreted. So almost all the protein translation, not all of it, but the vast majority is going through the secretory pathway. So when he used this cell type, he was able to get this beautiful result in a Nobel Prize, right? So, so the tricks to this whole experiment is use a specialized cell. Like I said, this is a very common concept you see in all of cell biology. Uh, pulse chase, right? So you, this concept of a pulse chase experiment shows up again and again. And then the real trick, and this is really the dawn of all modern cell biology, is to combine some label that allows you to visualize a molecule and combine it with imaging. So not only are you just tracking a, you know, in biochemistry you're tracking enzymes, or proteins, large macromolecules based on like absorbance or enzyme activity or something. This is allowing you to see where different types of molecules are in the cell and eventually how they change over time. And so that's what he was able to combine the pulse chase with radio labeling and EM microscopy to actually figure all this out.